Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to uh, introducing Semaphore with Mark Logic, uh, the missing piece of your data strategy. Uh, thank you for joining us today. This has been a, um, a hugely uh, popular um, event so far with uh, with lots of registration. So we hope that uh, you all get some value out of this today. We're going to be discussing um, Mark Logic and Semaphore as a combined solution. We're going to be talking through a number of use cases and some successful stories that we've had um, where we've had both uh, technologies integrated together. Um, we'll go through an introduction on our strategy and direction. Then we'll start with those use cases, looking at data cataloging and logistics, uh, data classification in pharma R&D, redaction and analytics and insurance. Um, then we're going to have a quick demo of the MarkLogic data platform with Semaphore. Um, and then we'll have a QA. and uh, I'd like to thank our speakers here today. We've got Stephen Reed, uh, Senior Account Manager. We've got uh, James Morris, uh, who's a solution architect. We've got Gerald Rabolski, who is a global Semaphore sales leader. And we've got Steve Ingrams, um, who's a senior solution architect and uh, VP who looks after our uh, architects globally. Digital Acceleration um, is an event series for you, by you. Um, what we mean by this is our work in the customer success team here at MarkLogic um, means that we have discussions with a lot of our customers about use cases that they're particularly doing in their organizations, but also they're interested in what we're doing elsewhere. And that's what this digital acceleration series is designed to do. It's designed to show you uh, new use cases, new ideas, and new innovations that you can bring into your business. We've got plans for multiple different um, events covering a variety of different topics. Uh, from publishing to pharma R&D to geospatial, uh, use of geospatial data. Um, and we're also looking to um, launch a new executive vision series um, where we discuss the MarkLogic technology along with Semaphore, um, the roadmap for those two um, and the vision going forward. Um, so by registering today um, and by signing up to our um, uh, bright talk uh, channel you'll be notified when these events come up um, if you've got any feedback for us if you've got any questions or queries or you'd like to suggest a topic then please reach out to us like i say this is your event um, you can contact us at csm at marklogic.com now I'm just going to discuss briefly the uh, MarkLogic data platform um, with uh, the MarkLogic server at its core. For MarkLogic customers, I'm sure you're aware of this. This has allowed you to load data as is into um, our next generation data platform. We can then unify that data, curate that data, um, apply advanced security, and then pass that data to downstream applications analytics and BI tools, machine learning and AI systems, as well as other downstream systems. The ability to harmonize, smart master, governance, semantics, handle reference data or metadata is all built into the MarkLogic data platform and provides an agile and robust system for you to uh, get access to the most of your data. We now combine that with Semaphore. Uh, Semaphore's uh, platform is un enabling you to unlock your data. It's enabling you to get the value within your data and bring insight back to your business. You can connect your data by connecting the data and the metadata in any form. You can then classify that data, organize that data. You are then in a, uh, able to create and generate metadata. You can assemble knowledge graphs, which means you can act on meaning. And you're able to consume that data, that curated data for trusted business insights is allowing your business to unlock the value in your data. The two technologies combined are really designed to simplify complex data challenges within your business. And that's what we're looking at here with some of the use cases that we have today. We'll talk to you about the challenges, the solutions, and the benefits it brought to the business. 
If you have any questions, please feel free to put them into the uh, into the chat. We'll pick up those questions and make sure we get you those answers. Um, if we can't get you the answers today, we'll make sure that we follow up with you um, via the um, Bright Talk details that you shared with us. Um, and we look forward to uh, answering your questions. We'll have a brief Q&A um, at the end of this talk. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you now to Stephen Reed, Senior Account Manager. And he's going to talk to you about data cataloging in logistics. Stephen, uh, it's over to you. Thank you so much, Philip. So again, my name is Stephen Reed. I'm a senior account manager specializing in the Semaphore uh, product portfolio here at MarkLogic. I'm located outside the uh, nation's capital in Washington, DC, and I'm gonna be presenting on one of my clients uh, focused on the logistics and supply chain industry. So if you look at the fundamental problem my client was, was faced with, it was really the inability to trust the data and be able to make good decisions out of the data that they were receiving. And, and, and the, the, the reason for that is they received a lot of this data from business partners. And, and I think my client's quote really summarized it great, which was customers who can't trust data, can't make good decisions and, and can't gain accurate insights. And this further, ram ram further ramification is it's really hard to move down that path of AI. There's been so much buzz about AI and specifically uh, machine learning and I think sometimes we overlook the fact that machine learning suffers from the same data quality issue as a lot of other applications. If I don't have good data going into my system, I'm gonna get bad results out. And by using a combination of Semaphore and the MarkLogic Data Hub platform, my clients was able to overcome these data quality issues. So a little bit about this customer. Uh, they're a, a Fortune 500 logistics company. They do both domestic and international shipments. They, they are primarily B2B. Um, and they provide end-to-end -end services, including customs brokering. So if you need a, you know, an airplane part moved from China to Nova Scotia, they'll figure it out. You know, maybe it's a, you know, an ocean cargo vehicle, a rail car, and then maybe for the last mile, you know, maybe there's a, a truck involved. But the, the kind of the complication here is they don't really own or lease any of their own transportation equipment. They rely 100% on their partner network in order to provide these types of transportation services. So this really caused a, a lot of, you know, kind of consternation sometimes with their customers. You know, they, they would be asked by their customers and the somewhat famous question these days is, is you know, where is my package? And when will it arrive? And if you think about just a, a domestic shipment, you know, yes, there's there's complications that. But then when you talk about international shipments, customs, brokerage, um, different carriers, different types of transportation vehicles, the problem gets really complicated really, really quick. And because of these types of challenges that they were faced with, there was a lot of different uh, errors that they had in their environment. And so one of the one of the core challenges that they have is that a lot of these systems, um, a lot of their partners, they were still doing things very, very manually, um, emails, phone calls, text messages, in order to schedule shipments you know, from, from point A to point B. And because there was you know, humans involved in this process, there were a lot of errors involved in this process. And, and yes, there were some you know, kind of basic errors, you know, syntax errors, you know, hey, I'm, I'm using the wrong state code for this shipment. Yes, some of those things were easy to catch. But then there were more complicated problems uh, like logic errors that were being missed and, and sometimes ignored. And an example uh, here is you know, you've got a, a shipment, it's maybe 200 cubic feet, of material and the storage vessel or container may only support 100 cubic feet. That's a problem. You're not going to be able to make that 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 shipment work. And a lot of times, those types of things were not being caught in their environment. A further complication was there's there was no common naming convention, no common language that was being used from one shipment provider to the next. So yes, there were some maybe some commonalities there in invoices and invoice, but then there were more subtle things like hey, when, when I'm scheduling a shipment from point A to point B, does that include the pallet dimensions? Or do I have to include the pallet dimensions to really get the real size of the shipment? So there's all those little things that really made it very hard, hard to have that common language go from one carrier's network to the other. And again, a lot of, lot of manual things going on there. And then finally, Yes, when you do things about or making shipments around finished goods, you know, the, the task is singular. Get this finished product 
from point A to point B. When you talk about raw materials that are destined for supply chain, there's, it's a lot more complicated product. There may be a timing associated with multiple shipments. The customer may say, hey, I need shipment A to arrive before shipment B. And oh, by the way, if shipment B comes first, um, I don't have the space to hold it. And you, Mr. Logistic Companies, you're going to have to hold it for me and pay for the storage costs until shipment A comes first. So that was, you know, really made a lot more challenging for them to think about how the supply chain would work and a lot of the logistics challenges that they would have. So one of the first decisions they had to make was really at the data level and, and how are they going to represent uh, what all these different types of partners and, and, and their data uh, sets really, really look like. Um, yeah, could we have gone down the traditional relational database path? Yeah, it, it could have potentially worked, but they realized very early on, it was going to be much easier, much more simpler to understand if they actually modeled all these relationships using a triple store. And that's really what made it successful and why they were able to do what they were able to do. They were able to basically take away the complexity of all these different relationships, put them in a triple store and express how customers were kind of talking to them through this method. Um, sometimes clients refer this, to this as like a digital twin, but that's kind of the idea they were doing. There was a digital representation of all the different languages that all their different partner networks were, were using. So what did this solution look like? Well, there was really two pieces of it. There was the semantic model that we built in Semaphore with them that really unlocked the meaning of the data that they were receiving from any partner. And this really provided three big three big wins for them. Number one is it provided a common language. So there was a way for them to really understand the meaning between all the different shipments they were, were they were getting. Uh, secondly, it was able them to validate the data at ingestion, uh, including um, some of those you know, tricky logic errors, which I referred to as before. And finally, it was a very extensible and governable platform in the sense that if they wanted to sign up another carrier, all they had to do was add that carrier's kind of data model, if you will, to their master model, and they can instantly ingest that model into the smart into the Mark Logic Data Hub platform. So once they had this this accurate data, they could move it into the the Mark Logic Data Hub, and then they could run all their logistics applications based off of that now very trusted data. And because it was trusted data, it enabled them to better serve their customers improve their own decision making internally, and ultimately mitigate some of their compliance risk, especially associated with customs and other border, borders issues as well, too. So where they're looking to take this project now into the future is now that I have that, that trusted data, I'm going to add on a layer of AI intelligence on top of it. So now they can be alerted as events come in that may impact shipments and carriers that they and their customers will be converted, uh, they will be notified in real time. So that's a summary of the solution, and uh, thank you for listening in. Uh, wow, cheers, uh, Stephen. That was a really interesting use case. Um, so much value out of that. I mean, the the amount of time that they've saved, uh, the insight that they've gotten back into their business, and interesting to see um, what they'll do next with the, with the combined power of the two. Um, we've just had one question come in through the chat. We can't unfortunately respond uh, by text, but we will uh, cover that up at the end. There is uh, This session is being recorded, um, and you will get a copy of this, um, and we'll work to um, try and get some of the presentation across to you um, as well in our follow-up. So thank you very much, um, Stephen. Uh, please, if you have any questions for Stephen, anything that he's presented, then uh, feel free to ask at the end. But uh, no, Stephen, thank you very much. Uh, so moving on, we've now got uh, James Morris, the solution architect. Um, he's going to discuss data for classification um, in pharma R&D, um, which is a strong use case um, for us um, in, this, in this vertical. Um, so James, over to you. Thanks, Philip. Um, I'm just making sure my screen is able to be shared here. Let me just check that. I think something went awry. Thank you. OK. <laughs> uh, so thanks. So yes, uh, my name is uh, uh, Jim Morris. And I've been with the company about seven years working with the Semaphore product. My background is as a librarian, informatician, I've worked in pharmaceutical research libraries for most of my career, 
uh, or informatics functions, enterprise taxonomy roles uh, before uh, joining uh, MarkLogic. And I'm going to talk about a particular use case at one of our pharma, our joint pharma uh, clients. And it's uh, about how they've used both capabilities of to provide the necessary kind of content uh, harvesting, normalization, intelligent tagging, and distribution uh, that keeps the researchers, what I would call it, like hypercurrent on the latest information relevant to their specific uh, interests. So this company uh, is one of the top 10 uh, biopharmaceutical companies. Uh, we have a few other top 10 uh, companies as clients. Uh, they've been a customer for both uh, products for over five years. And MarkLogic is used to do uh, some very interesting things. One of them, which is a really innovative uh, a collaboration tool that works with internal information. It has social aspects of it, feedback, alerts. Uh, it's very cool how it manipulates all that data very quickly and, and keeps everybody on the same team. Uh, in Semaphore, there is managing the uh, biomedical ontologies uh, that are, are so informative in, in pharmaceutical research. And those are stored in MarkLogic and distributed from MarkLogic to other systems. Uh, but they also provide the very uh, specialized uh, indexing and extraction of like key facts uh, from uh, research documents. And by biomedical ontologies, you know, we're talking about uh, these are these are models that are uh, maybe developed in academia, re reused uh, in an organization like this. Uh, it might involve it proprietary taxonomies that are specific to this company. Um, you know, and these are ontologies that not just model knowledge about you know, life sciences, but actually model context. Like, how do we find this information uh, in text? And when we talk about specialized indexing and extraction, well. Uh, I want to look at a specific use case uh, on 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 where we're applying that, and it's really about keeping researchers up to date, really up to the minute on research reported in uh, the external world, the scientific literature. So it really comes down to uh, this question, and it's it's really what uh, traditionally uh, organizations have depended on, like a library type function to provide. It's 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 not about the information necessarily that you have internal. It's it's the everything that's being produced outside your company, being published or available through proprietary sources. So in more detail, you know, it's really about making these informed decisions as quickly as possible based on what's appearing outside and, and to do it faster than your competitors are doing. And these different sources all used are different indexing. They do, they're, they're accessed in different ways. And, and these researchers are just spending too much time going to these different systems uh, and and uh, another reason you don't want to do that too much is because you're exposing your interests by using these external sources. So you really need to bring it in house in order to make the best use of this information and then apply the specific indexing that really makes the difference and, and ties it to your proprietary interests. And that's really a key point. I mean, the, these uh, researchers in these different um, scientific areas are experts and they're experts not just in the topic, but experts on what the company knows about it that nobody else does. And that's what they're trying to keep track of. So it's a very specific type of need. And so what they, the solution involved uh, creating these uh, portals uh, or dashboards, if you will, that present the information that's being harvested from uh, externally uh, as quickly as possible. So these are, these are portals focused on specific research areas, specific research teams. Uh, to give them exactly what they need. It's, it's published, reported research with these custom filters and ways to manipulate the data based on you know, genetic target, uh, different types of cancers, costs of illnesses, treatments, therapies, diagnoses, even things like real world evidence uh, from uh, patient records or, or doctor's notes. And really we're bringing in uh, tens of thousands of pieces of the content uh, all the time, every day in, into MarkLogic. And then MarkLogic, and then Semaphore looks at that content and provides very precise indexing based on the researcher interests. And these interests are modeled as ontology. That's what an ontology is. It's a, it's a model of knowledge, right? Um, so uh, this content from many sources is now organized, not by how each system wants to organize it, but specifically by how the researchers need to understand it, uh, by interests that really only they have, um, and that's their competitive advantage.
And then these strategies and ontologies are continually honed as, as research evolves. So it's, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, that, that enough is, is, is fascinating and, and really a unique proposition of our, of our joint solutions. But I wanted to just take a, a minute to zero in on something that I think is very, very interesting that they did specifically to help um, these strategies work uh, effectively. And it goes beyond just you know leveraging the Marklogic platform, but also um, uh, AI and, and machine learning capabilities. So consider one of these portals. Maybe you're a researcher, you're a specialist in in pain, uh, an important therapeutic area. But maybe you're a specialist even even more specifically in in back pain, or that's that's the area that you're focusing on, back pain. How would you find that concept in literature? You know, if you were going to Google or, or PubMed or some tool like that, what would you do? Well, you could type in back pain. You could look for concepts like back somewhere near pain. Uh, there may be particular indexing that you might be able to use. But consider this example on the left, because you think this would be simple, but it's not. Um, these terms back and pain can be very ambiguous. Uh, and if you look on the left, um, back to the future and pain management, is that about back pain? Not really. Uh, it's about pain but it's not about back pain specifically. So it's really not the article that we're looking for. And consider these um, uh, sentences on the right as well. Sentences uh, that you're, you're, you absolutely do find in this literature that they're bringing in, whether it's from real world evidence or from specific articles. And only a few of these are actually relevant to back pain if you look through them. So how might Semaphore uh, help researchers make better sense of this? And the answer is in how Semaphore deals with the ambiguity of, of language. Um, so Semaphore uses a combination of not just the ontology models we spoke about that, that kind of drive the indexing, but also a uh, machine trained natural language processing engine that's part of Semaphore. That's how we understand uh, uh, syntax in, in multiple it's different syntax, parts of speech, expressions like nouns. For Tell the difference between something like the back of my neck and uh, back to the future and things like that. So just how does Semaphore do this? Well, it really has two ways of processing content. And it does this with every one of those 10,000 pieces of content that's coming through. First, um, we, we, drive our, we use our ontologies to drive very specific text analytics rules that find evidence for those uh, ontology classes in, in text. And the second phase on the bottom is we look at each piece of content and we do that deep, uh, at deep um, NLP, natural language processing analysis of, it, analysis of it. And that's how we understand parts of speech, phrase structure, how we automatically stem words. Um, and by combining these two things is how, really how we find we're, how, what we're interested in. And either or is, is, is limited. You need to be able to be able to use the advantages of both types of approaches and, and, and have it be flexible because out of the box NLP engines just aren't, um, aren't as flexible. When you combine it with the ontologies, you get that. So for example, if we look at a picture of semaphore here quickly, um, this is just a, a little view in the semaphore. You can see we're, at, we're modeling this concept of back. You know, this is kind of a scientific term and an anatomical site of the back. That's what we're looking for but we can apply parts of speech along with other types of evidence that we're looking for this, but not that. And you, know, you don't need to do this with every term in your ontology, not by any means, but when it's specifically ambiguous, you have this power to do it. Uh, and I think it's really exciting uh, what, what, the, uh, uh, what the information scientists at this company did to, to enable us. So the key takeaway here is these combined solution of Mark Logic and Semaphore combines the necessary content harvesting, normal, normalizing, intelligent normalizing and distribution that Mark Logic is so good at, combined with the intelligent tagging and NLP capabilities of Semaphore to keep researchers, researchers hypercurrent on the latest information relevant to their specific proprietary interests. Only Mark Logic can handle this wide variety of content types and data coming from all these sources and handle it very quickly with no conversion. And it can keep it secure, resilient. It can normalize the structure, et cetera. And then applying with Semaphore's enterprise capabilities to manage these models very effectively and socially with multi-users, subject matter or subject matter oriented knowledge models, and our best in breed natural language processing. 
And that's what enables those dashboards and portals to filter through the complex text and extract the necessary data needed to actually make that content useful, applicable, and strategically relevant. Back to you, Philip. Thank you. James, thank you very much for that. Um, it really is fascinating stuff. Um, and I, I, I love that back pain example, being able to ask that natural language question, you know, rather than just typing in, as you can see there, research hub, you can type in, show me a research hub that deals in back pain. Um, and being able to answer those type of questions enables, you know, data scientists, the scientists themselves to get to that insight um, and value quicker. So yeah, really strong, really powerful use case there. So, um, so thank you very much. Um, we're going to move on now. Um, we're just going to have a brief um, Q and A. Uh, sorry, not Q and A. Uh, poll with our audience now. Um, these polls are designed to um, answer questions um, about future events, about whether you've seen what you've seen today that you liked, and things like that. Um, and they really give us uh, an insight into what you'd like to see going forward. So. Um, I believe my colleagues at Bright Talk are going to bring up a quick poll um, here, and we'll have that for about two minutes, um, and then we'll um, move on to the uh, talk with uh, Gerard and uh, Steve um, there. So um, we'll give that a couple of minutes to run. Um, again, if you've got any questions, um, then please feel free to put that in the chat. Um, support for other languages besides English like Spanish? Um, well, there's a, there's, a, there's a wide variety of um, languages that are supported by uh, both MarkLogic and Semaphore, um, and Spanish being one of them. Um, but there is um, languages, uh, I believe Japanese is in there, um, German, French, there's a, there's a whole raft of um, languages that are supported. Um, uh, and I believe Spanish is fully supported by the platform. So, um, so yes, uh, to answer that, we can definitely help you uh, with uh, with your Spanish natural language queries. Um, I could see some answers coming in, um, which is great. Um, like I say, those future topics um, that you'd like us to cover off, um, please do let us know um, what you'd like to um, what you'd like to see going forward in the the future. Um, this one here um, is about this uh, future topics. So the smarter content authoring and publishing uh, using MarkLogic with business intelligence tools like Tableau and the MarkLogic vision uh, roadmap and uh, key features customer forum. Uh, that's probably where we're going to try and invite some of our executives along um, and our product management team to, to really get some feedback from our customers in the field. So, um, so please feel free to, to, to let us know what you think on those. Um, and again, any questions, just uh, pop them into the, uh, into the poll, uh, into the tab there, and we'll, um, we'll get those answered. Um, we're just coming up. There's about 15 seconds before we're going to close uh, the poll. Um, and then uh, we'll move on to the, the next presentation. Um, and again, looking forward to, um, to, to seeing this particular one. It's a fascinating use case um, with, uh, with one of our customers. So I'll bring these questions up again um, after the, uh, after the, the demo. Um, so if you haven't had a chance to answer, you can always answer then as well. So let me just finish that one off there um, and then let me bring up my slides now. So um, I'd just like to introduce um, Gerard Rabolski. Um, so if I can, there we go. And um, uh, he'll be joined uh, midway through by uh, Steve Ingram. But uh, Gerard, thanks for joining us. Um, you're going to be talking about redaction analytics in uh, medical indemnity. Uh, I'm going to take no further time. I'll hand it over to you. Great. Thank you, Philip. As the uh, landscaping crew comes right across my window, perfect timing as usual, but uh, just bear with me. I hope it's not too much of a distraction, but I am Gerard Rabalski. I lead the uh, Semaphore sales team, uh, and then joining me and helping me uh, discuss this use case will be Stephen Ingram, uh, who leads our the Semaphore solution architecture team as well. 
So today, as Philip mentioned, we're going to be discussing uh, one of our customers who happens to be one of the largest medical indemnity organizations in the world. They're a member-owned, not-for-profit uh, protection organization that supports medical, dental, and healthcare professionals. So they came to us with a couple of challenges. They uh, have been in business for over a hundred years. So they have a hundred years worth of case notes that contain company know-how, uh, you know, information contained that's unstructured in these case notes that they knew if they could really leverage, they would help the company provide a better service to their customers. In addition to that, those case notes, of course, contained large amounts of personal identifiable information that was a liability, of course, under GDPR and other privacy regulations that are popping up across the globe. So the solution was uh, Semaphore's semantic model, which helps customers understand and enrich text uh, with relevant metadata and a 360 view of their data, which also allows them to safely leverage that data for better decision making. And really what they challenged us with was uh, they wanted to secure PII information uh, and to comply with regulations. They also wanted to leverage key knowledge found in that hundred years worth of unstructured information uh, to be used uh, in predictive analytics. They also wanted to integrate automated classification and text extraction services to expand upon the IDC 10 model classification in order to support a more rich and robust analytics experience. And so the way we helped was enabling our knowledge model management module, which allows organizations to enrich and manage a model that incorporates the SNOMED ontology, our classification and language services module, automatically help them to examine information and appropriately tag key fields such as their name, addresses, medical numbers, birth dates, et cetera, uh, and replace that manual ICD-10 classification with an automated next-gen SNOMED classification. The, we also deployed uh, the fact and extraction framework module to create a document fingerprint that combines NLP entity recognition with identification of contextual facts to identify medical PII in a diverse set of content types. And so they received value in three ways. Uh, they improved their analytics because that model and the metadata were now used to classify and tag medical documentation found in textual documents that was once unavailable to the organization. And this helped to support large scale population analysis research. They were also able to recognize decreased costs. That large scale analysis of case notes allowed the company to identify negative trends in their insurance cases and put in steps to mitigate those negative trends. And then finally, elimination of duplication. So once the documents are redacted, they can then be discarded, but the redacted corpus can be used for further analysis. So Philip, any questions there where we can hand it off to uh, Steve? Steve's gonna go through a little bit of semaphore mark logic architecture and then a demo. Guess there's uh, no questions then. Um, yeah, well, uh, just before, sorry, just <laughs> uh, on the update there. Um, just, uh, just would had a couple of questions come in, um, and one's uh, I think a really interesting one, which is how much support such guidance is available to Semifar uh, to learn how to make effective ontologies and models. Is this uh, useful if you don't have a team of trained data scientists? in your organization? So we do provide online self-paced uh, training. We have four different uh, training segments that we provide. There's foundational trainings for your beginners 101 course. We have advanced training, fact extraction training, and then admin training as well. Uh, in addition to that, we hold a monthly community forum where our customers get on a call around a specific topic, share best practices, tips, tricks, lessons learned. Uh, of course, we also offer professional services for customized training um, with regards to how many people you would need 
you know, it depends on the organization and, and how heavily you're, you're implementing semaphore. But, you know, Steve, I don't know. There's probably not a, a one size fits all depending on what the use case is. But anything you would want to add to that? So um, one thing I would add is that semaphore is designed to be used by a subject matter expert. It's not you don't require a degree in information science to be able to use it. We have customers who are maintaining corporate ontologies and we're talking big uh, international software firms. Um, where the, the corporate ontology is being maintained by somebody who has no, and she admits she has no information science training. She's, but she's happy to do that uh, using the tools that uh, Semaphore provide. Um, as and uh, there is, there are some obviously. So there's some organisations where we there are there is a team of information scientists because they seek significant. You know, their basic business depends on the quality of the taxonomy and the enrichment. Uh, other organisations where they have occasional support from us, and one other organisation where they haven't required any changes in the last 18 months so it's uh, it as, as gerard said it's it's a, a very wide range of uh, requirements of, of um yeah um, courses of courses yeah if you yeah i think one of the 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 key feedback is that the ui is 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 meant for people that aren't specialized that don't have that training it is it's meant to and it's one of the feedback that i get from customers which is actually we think we can accelerate our ontology driven projects or semantics driven projects because of the, the, the UI and how intuitive that is. So, um, so it's definitely a key part of that. Um, and I'd just like to ask um, one more question before we move on, um, Steve, um, which is, I'm wondering if I already have my documents in MarkLogic and I have an ontology that I want to use, how to connect Semaphore with MarkLogic so I can use the ontology to extract documents of interest in MarkLogic um, with other defined triples? A very straightforward process. So if the ontology is in a um, one of the standard interchange formats, we can import it straight into Semaphore. Um, and then there are a lot of customers using integration with the MarkLogic database um, and receiving enrichment from Semaphore. So it's a, it's a very straightforward integration. Brilliant. No, that's, that's, that's great. We'll, we will uh, come back to some of the questions um, that we've got. They're, they're coming in thick and fast now, so um, so that, that's good to see. I'm going to hand over now to, to Steve. Steve's going to uh, give you a bit more detail on the, um, the architecture behind the solution that um, Gerard's uh, described, and then he's going to give you a, uh, a inside view of uh, Semaphore and MarkLogic uh, working together um, and what you can do with that. So, Steve, it's over to you. Thank Excellent. you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so, this is a sort of summary, sort of solution architecture of the um, uh, application that Gerard was outlining. Uh, on the left hand side, we have uh, MarkLogic, uh, in this case, operating as um, a, a document store and also a platform for, for analytics. Uh, did I say on the right hand side? I meant on the left hand side. Sorry, I'm, gonna, I'm temporarily mirrored at the moment. Um, and on the right hand side, we have Semaphore which is um, primed with the um, systemized nomenclature uh, of medicine or SNOMED and the International Classification of Diseases, uh, ICD-10, so the mappings to uh, codes. Also uh, configured in Semaphore are the extraction patterns that we use for um, identifying patterns and, and pieces of text in, in the document. So how these systems work together is that a document, uh, an unredacted document is, is checked uh, into Mark Logic, and as part of that process, it's sort of submitted uh, the text is extracted from that document, submitted to Semaphore, and Semaphore responds with a metadata payload, which can contain um, a number of of components, which kind of break down into three categories. There are um, values from uh, taxonomies or ontologies loaded into uh, Semaphore. In this case, SNOMED and ICD-10, and these are the values that we judged to be most relevant to the document that's just been submitted. There is the identification of uh, natural language entities, so things like names, locations, places. And then the third piece is the, um, the fact extraction. So this is where we may well be combining both the NLP entity identification and uh, values coming from, from taxonomies and returning these as, as facts. So whereas the NLP engine can determine that uh, uh, something that's it's been identified is a name, the fact extraction pattern will take that name, look at the context of where that name appears, and determine that this is the name of um, uh, it's a medical professional, or it's the patient, or it's an unidentified name, 
and so we can actually provide context around the uh, what the NLP engine uh, is, is is returning. And then what happens is the next there's two processes. The initial process is is the um, uh, metadata is added to the uh, the envelope pattern as the document is is submitted into into MarkLogic. Um, and then secondly, the a process will go through the uh, identified um, terms which are need to be redacted, and then we'll physically remove that from the copy of the uh, document that goes forward. And after that, the um, the old copy, the unredacted copy, can be safely discarded. So they're safe from a GDPR perspective. There's no liability. All the all the um, uh, PII can be defended. You know, if it's found, it can be defended. It may be needed for processing, or it can be defended because a robust um, process is in place for managing that. Um, and then, uh, so this the you have redacted clean content that's marked up uh, and usable for for the analytical processes. So they can use it to determine, you know, whether or not they should defend a case or or just settle out of court. And then the second process that happens here is an aggregation. So Semaphore works at a, at the document level. So um, a document is submitted, it will be analyzed for um, against the taxonomies. It'll be analyzed against the NLP engine. It'll be in this case, uh, fact extraction performed on it. Um, and then the metadata is assigned at the document level. But um, the uh, company in question has, you know, typically has 400 pieces of correspondence um, that will go towards an individual case. And what they actually want to see is case level roll up of what are the key um, SNOMED findings, what are the um, the uh, say misadventures that took place. So they want to see that at the case level. And so a quite quite sophisticated algorithm within MarkLogic is um, scoring the individual documents and applying weights depending if it's a correspondence or an email or a letter, um, and then ro rolling up the scores to give a, a case level view of you know what is what is the case, what was the what was the clinical process, how what was the outcome, was there any misadventures, um, and and so on, and that's all, all. So it's rolled up to to the case level as well as allowing uh, drill down to the uh, document. And as Gerard said, the um, by automating that process, there's all significant benefits in two, two respects. One is obviously they don't require a human to physically eyeball each document and determine um, what the classification is. Uh, but more, more to the point is that a machine is able to go to a much level, much deeper level. So rather than settle at a high level classification, so this is uh, you know leg surgery, you could say, well, this is surgery of the leg between the knee, knee and the ankle. And so go to go to much much more deeper level uh, of, of granularity. So that is the um, architecture for the uh, redaction and, and analytics platform. Um, what I wanted to do now is is move on to um, an actual demonstration of uh, Semaphore itself. So this is this is um, this is I'm going to be showing you now. Uh, semaphore, and I'll show. I'm not. I'm not going to be demonstrating the reduction analytics platform. So sadly, all the applications that we've been talking about are all quite quite clear, closely guarded and protected by the organisations that have deployed them because they see them as significant value. But what I'm going to do is take you through the Semaphore product and show how it uh, each of the capabilities touches on the um, the use cases, the examples, and references you just you've just heard. So let me now switch to a browser. And hopefully you're now seeing um, welcome to Semaphore. So this is um, this is Semaphore, uh, and there are three things that um, Semaphore does. And there is the uh, modeling, the management of um, knowledge models, semantic models, taxonomies, ontologies, catalogs, reference data, um, and that's represented by the green piece on the left. There is the um, use of those models of the NLP engine to classify and enrich content. And that's represented by the piece in the middle, which is a test tool for that. And on the uh, right hand side, we have the integration. So it's using using the models to provide information to downstream systems. So this is allowing um, applications to search and browse and obtain term information from the models models themselves. And these three pieces are always used, uh, always used in combination. So the logistics application that Stephen was, was, was going through early on, this is a combination of the model management and the integration. So the models have managed their re reference together, mapped together using the modeling tool. 
and then um, the integration piece is providing the information to downstream systems to actually perform perform the integrate integration. The pharma uh, R and D application again model management, but also an emphasis there on um, pulling information in from subject matter experts. So collaborating on the management of the models and bringing in models, uh, industry models, and providing uh, specific definitions over the top of those. And then the application of those uh, through the enrichment engine using the classification server. Um, to, and this is a case of we're actually doing semantic classification. And then lastly, same two components delivering the reduction and analytics platform. So the models are managed uh, in, in the knowledge model manager, the green piece. And then the classification server is what's actually delivering the enrichment. And in this case, not only values from the SNOMED uh, taxonomy, but also values that have been read by the NLP engine and the um, and indeed the fact extraction fact, fact extraction framework. And it's worth pointing out that um, all the customers that we have for Semaphore and MarkLogic and um, Semaphore as well, are all it's all exactly the same software. The only thing that's changing is the um, model, models that are managed within Semaphore. So it's a tool that can be used across a whole variety uh, of industries. So with that, let me actually start to show how uh, Semaphore can, can add value. So I'm going to use um, this piece here. This is this blue classification box, and this is um, this is a this actually what I'm going to run here is a test tool. So normally classification runs as a service. It's busy enriching content submitted from a variety of sources, either mark logic, search engines. Um, uh, it's uh, so it runs as a service, and this is kind of a window onto the service that so you can use a, as a test tool just to see how things are working. And also, it's very useful for for demonstrating capabilities of Semaphore. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to drop in a document um, for test. And what I'm going to do is this word document. So let me just open it up and stick it off to one side. But I'm going to classify this uh, against the server um, that has been configured with a, a knowledge model. Uh, actually, a number of model knowledge models. One of which is one of our standard models, which is uh, space missions. And what what this uh, tool is now doing is it's breaking the document open, taking out the text, um, analyzing it against the knowledge model, analyzing it against the uh, NLP engine, and returning the metadata that it's found. So on the left hand side we have the text that's received from the document, and on the right hand side we have the various categories of information um, coming from. Uh, in this case, it's all, this is all uh, semantic classification. This is all coming from uh, a knowledge model. And so we have a number of the number of astronauts. These are all in our model. Um, we have a mission. We have an organization program and some some general topics. Now, um, for each case, we have the uh, the classify the, the categorization the category. Sorry, this is astronaut. The value that's come back and a confidence score. So some of us a highly deterministic system can be audited, um, and all, you can always find out exactly why a document was classified a certain way or indeed uh, wasn't classified a certain way. But the interesting thing here is um, if we actually look, look a little bit down, look at the where the mission is, is mentioned or mission classification is assigned. This has been assigned uh, with a score of 93%. Uh, it's been assigned the category of Apollo 11. But um, if you actually look at this document, um, and this is the copy I, I have here, um, it's just a Word document. It's actually text taken from Wikipedia. Um, and it was actually taken from the Wikipedia article on Apollo 11. Um, but the point being that while it mentions Apollo a few times, it doesn't it doesn't actually mention Apollo 11 anywhere in the text itself. However, what it does mention is the three astronauts that are mentioned, uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, and, and Michael Collins. Um, all, these are the highest scoring astronauts. They are obviously the astronauts of the Apollo 11 mission. It has the same launch vehicle, Saturn V. It has the call signs of the Apollo 11 vehicle. It has the landing point of Apollo 11. Um, and it has the internal codes for Apollo 11. So there's enough information in this document to, for us to safely say it's about Apollo 11, even though the term Apollo 11 doesn't appear anywhere in this document. And this really is the benefit of uh, using uh, knowledge models. Because you can, you can encode all this information. So you can, you know, something doesn't, you know, we're not looking at keywords here. It doesn't need to have to say Apollo 11 for it to be about Apollo 11 because we are modeling Apollo 11 as a concept. So this is now uh, the knowledge uh, model manager. This is the space missions model. And indeed, this is the Apollo 11 uh, concept. And what we're showing here is 
And this is the concept itself, the details. And on the left-hand side, we have where it appears in the taxonomy. And in a model managed in semaphore, uh, there's, it's fully poly hierarchical. The concept can have multiple parents, can appear in multiple parts uh, of your taxonomy. And we don't force any particular structure. So you adopt the model that match, matches both, best matches your, um, your application. If you um, want to, uh, if you think visually, then you can actually uh, look at the relationships. Um, we can show you the concept in question and show you its nearest neighbors. Indeed, you can use this so we could go from Apollo 11 to uh, Neil Armstrong. Um, and then uh, similarly, we can then go uh, on, onwards from there if we wanted to. Um, or, and so let me go back to, um, back to Apollo 11 again. Now the question came in about it being multilingual. So Semaphore is is fully fully multilingual. Uh, you have the concept of Apollo Eleven. Um, it will have a preferred label in as many languages as you need. Um, so we have Apollo Eleven in German, English, Spanish, Korean, and Chinese. Um, the, the actual label isn't important. What is important? It's a semantic system. So. Every concept has a URI, every concept has a GUID. So you could have, if you wanted, if you had, for some reason you had a model that needed to have Apple the fruit and Apple the, Apple the company and Apple the daughter of Gwyneth Paltrow, you can absolutely have those concepts in there, but they will all be individual concepts. They will all typically be distinguished by uh, the class. Um, so one would be a, a, a fruit, one would be a company, and one would be a person. Um, concept can have multiple classes. It's, you know, and again, you're not forced to have only one. Um, so you can support multiple classes if it makes sense in your model. Underneath the preferred terms, um, which have to be one, one maximum one per language, we have the um, alternative labels, so other ways of referring to that term. And these can just be used for providing additional evidence if you want to actually determine if a document is about a particular topic. And so we have, again, German, Spanish, uh, other definitions in here. And these alternative labels, these alternative labels could be just generic. You know, so it's a synonym, it's an alternate label, or it could be meaningful. So because this is uh, a space mission, it has a call sign um, as an alternative label, whereas an astronaut might have a nickname, for example. And we we enforce it. So you can't define anything here that isn't isn't relevant uh, to a mission. On the center uh, right hand side, um, these are the uh, relationships. So we have associative relationships going across the model. So in this case, it's a mission. So it has a crew, as a spacecraft, um, a landing point, launch point, launch vehicle. And underneath there are hierarchical relationships, so broader and narrow, so parents or, or children thereof. Um, underneath that, uh, new in the most recent version of Semaphore, we have the ability to actually map to external sources, not configured in this model, but you can link, you can link to um, vocabularies that are maintained elsewhere. You can link it to reference data systems. And this is using the uh, industry standard open refine uh, format. On the uh, extreme right hand side, um, you'll see here what we have is uh, a number of uh, tools for, for improved sort of productivity tools for maintaining and managing models. So here we have what's called the Let's Call Resources side panel. And this is an index of 40 million Wikipedia articles. And what this is doing is taking the concept that you have currently displayed, and it's actually looking up terms that might be related to it. So a lot of these have already been, been captured. Um, but we have, for example, the first moon landing, um, which doesn't isn't one that we currently have. Um, and if we go lower down, so actually the three types of information that, that we return in the Let's Call Resources side panel, there are signpost terms which are highly significant for the concept in question. Um, there are terminology clusters which have a slightly less, uh, less, less. We, we judge them to be slightly less relevant, and at the bottom there'll be um, other terms that might be related. Um, and so, if you actually look in under uh, terminology clusters, we also have some concepts around faking the moon landing. So maybe we wanted to actually have those. And how this tool works would work would be um, you could actually then say add those terms, and they will go across. And so you, even if you start off with a just bald set of definitions. There are tools in Semaphore allowing you to provide your additional, you know, so for example, it could be a, a bald set of industry definitions. You want to provide some additional richness, maybe some provide some additional project names, uh, then you can provide that um, using using the lexical resources side panel. Um, and then another thing we also provide is a translation widget. So we use um, 
uh, actually, this is this is your cognitive services for this one, but we um, you don't need to take a uh, this is done provided on your behalf. Um, and so you can select uh, the language you want to transfer. So we have the English labels. Perhaps we want uh, to transfer them to a Russian. Russian. So I can submit it them off to uh, translation services. If I understood Russian, I could uh, understand if these were right or not. And if I'm tapping, I can just add them across and they go across as additional metadata. And there are a number of other tools um, for improving that process that we're adding uh, incrementally. We have a tool for actually using uh, mining uh, small subsets of documents as well. So we can start to surface terms that appear alongside uh, concepts, um, but in your own in your own content. And so it's all around making making the model uh, richer, because obviously the richer the model, the more benefit it is to to everybody. So that's the um, the model management side. Um, so that's typically what's being done for the, uh, the R and D application, and also the um, some part of the reduction part. But the other the other part of the reduction, um, so that's the analytics part of the reduction analytics deployment. Um, but actually, what we also uh, want to be able to do is I'm going to show you how the um, the two the entity end extraction and fact extraction work. So for this, uh, using a slightly different server, I'll use a slightly slightly different document. Um, so I have, for example, here is um, is a it's actually a, a sort of expense claim uh, PDF, which hopefully is about to appear. Yeah, so here we have a simple simple expense claim. Um, and I'm going to drop this into uh, an enrichment engine, which has been this is really just using um, the NLP engine. So um, you see that coming back again, the left hand side, this is the text that's been retrieved from the PDF. On the right hand side, the categories of information. So you can see that the uh, entity um, engine is identifying. We have um, credit card details. We have uh, an email address. We have um, a name. Uh, and there's another rather number of other pieces of information being returned. Now, but the point, the real point being is that we've also modeled alongside, well, with in conjunction with the NLP engine, we were modeling the actual compliance regime that we need to respect. And so what this is returning is saying, actually, we, we have information in this document that means it needs to be compliant with GDPR because we have uh, a name and we have an email address. Um, and we also need to be compliant with PCI DSS because we have credit card details. And so this is this is the this is the, the the core of the of the redaction platform. So we process the document, uh, and we identify um, the key pieces of information that that indeed need to be uh, redacted. Um, now the last thing that that we can we can I also wanted to cover off is is in more detail around the the fact extraction process. So um, what we showed you is using knowledge models to enrich um, using the NLP engine to identify concepts but actually what you can also do is combine both of those two into um into what we call a fact extraction definition which is just another another set of models which can be managed within uh, the knowledge model manager and what this can be done is you actually used to pull information uh, actionable information out of out of documents so the document i just submitted for classification is um, a u.s treasury advisory notice and this one in particular is about human trafficking and there's a lot of information in here describing what is human trafficking, how does it differ, differ between human smuggling. Um, but the key, the key piece of information here is really the red flags that organizations need to look for. Um, and this is buried in this, this, this document um, uh, in, this, in this table here. But what we can do is use the NLP engine, use the fact extraction framework, use the fact extraction part of Semaphore. Um, and we can process that information and we can look for key pieces of information. So the first thing we're going to do is look for the patterns that give away that this is a guidance note. Um, and, and we do that using a process called fingerprinting. And then actually, we also want to retrieve into a form that be consumed the actual guidance reference number itself. So this is A008 issued by the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network on 11th of September 2014. So we can store that as metadata. Um, conveniently, we did have some helpful metadata in the title, but it wasn't didn't give us the reference number or the actual issue date. Um, and we can also uh, return any guidance uh, information that's referenced uh, from inside this document. But really, the, what the meat and drink is, we want to actually return those guide those red flags that were in that table. And, and we can actually do that. So what we can do is rather than say, well, you know, it has to be on page two, 
Um, what we can say is find any row of a table that has some text, uh, mentions some affected institutions, maybe talks about um, regional information, and maybe talks about some financial transfers, and identify that as, a, as an item. So here we have uh, one of those red flags for, taken from the table. So we have the um, very wrong one. We have the uh, that's the advisory text. So that's what the client really wants to know about. We indicate um, what are the affected institutions. So banks, um, credit unions, uh, money transmitters, and we're giving the regional information. So um, what we can do from here is two things. We can take that PDF. We can actually rip the important information out. And we can either route it to the person in, in question or the organization in question as, as, as a newsletter. But more importantly, we could potentially more importantly, we can actually now lift this table and pass it down for machine uh, machine learning or further analytics. So in this way, semaphore is being used to uh, kind of do the heavy lifting. So rather than burn carbon processing an awful lot of text, which isn't actually of any value, you can use semaphore to identify what is of value, pass that down to a machine learning algorithm, and then train it accordingly. Um, and then uh, lastly on this, uh, another application for the same uh, same technology. So this is a SEC form 10K. Um, and so we're able to pull out standard information like the reporting date and the reporting entity. And also we can pull out the jurisdiction. Um, and um, But more importantly, we can actually start to read the document. So you know, Michigan, so state of jurisdiction and, and entity are, are kind of obvious fields within a form 10K. But all we actually may want to know is what is the market capitalization of that organization? And what we can actually do is, um, if it's reversed, it's not, not responding it, but th there's a paragraph in here that does discuss um, uh, the market cap. And we can look for where, how that's expressed, because um, there'll be certain consistency in how that's expressed. Look for an amount in that sentence and return that as a market cap. So if you were given a thousand PDFs and you wanted to actually plot the top 10 companies by, or the top 10 jurisdictions by aggregate market value, the only other way you could do it would be to read those thousand PDFs and write, record those values manually. But if you're actually using uh, MarkLogic and Semaphore, uh, you can process the documents, put out the information that's necessary, and then use the uh, analytics platform in MarkLogic to actually respond with those kinds of uh, those kinds of queries. So that's a, a bit of a lightning tour um, through the uh, Semaphore knowledge model management, enrichment classification, enrichment fact extraction, and the NLP processing. And I hope that's given you a flavor for um, how we were able to deliver the values in the three uh, use cases that we outlined at the beginning of this session. And with that, I think I'm passing back to Philip. Uh, yes, Steve, thank you very much. Um, it's, uh, it's great to see the technology in action. Um, and as you can imagine, we've probably only just scratched the surface um, of, of what's available. Um, thank you to all our speakers. We're just going to go now um across to do a q a um so we're going to cover off some of the questions that we've had in the um in the in the chat um we'll have some polls going up uh, again if you could uh, answer those just uh, give us provide us that feedback so we can make these events uh better for you going forwards um i just wanted to um talk about one of the questions that we had earlier which was the um support and guidance question um available with um semaphore um you know support and guidance has been available with mark logic uh for for a number of years now and and the same in uh semaphore um with the professional services team um these are people who are highly skilled with the uh, technology um worked on number of deployments um and in semaphore's case include um, information scientists and taxonomists to help you get started um, on your modeling um, along with that UI along with the the training program that, and the uh, additional literature that they have so um, so yeah that's um, that's really interesting um, I just want to pick up and I think I think uh, James Morris is probably going to be the best person to ask this question but I had one question come in um, and I thought it was quite interesting because I know it's um, quite a um, in topic uh, at the moment, certainly in, uh, in, in the data world, which is many people find data mesh preferred um, versus data lakes. Um, now, again, uh, you know, I'll go to Mark Logic side of things. 
we are a data hub. Um, but how would you integrate that with uh, Mark Logic and Semaphore? How would you integrate that data mesh with Mark Logic and Semaphore? Yeah, great question. I mean, these uh, the data lakes um, often just turn into data swamps because people think they just bring all the data into one place. And that doesn't necessarily mean that the data connects together. And, and you're, when you're when when the words like mesh and fabric and things like that are used, you're really uh, you're really implying that you're you're forming a kind of graph with the data to be able to understand how all your data connects together. So uh, while uh, while MarkLogic brings can bring the data in uh, from all the different uh, formats and sources and bring it in and 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 do some uh, uh, you know, mapping between data sources. There's often a, a, a semantic challenge to it. And what I mean by that is that you know, even words that are exactly the same in different sources or uh, uh, could have different meaning. And if you just start connecting things based on you know literal strings, you might not be building the, the knowledge network that you're that you're expecting. Um, in addition, uh, that some of those examples that Steve just gave of pulling data out of tables, maybe the thing that makes your data uh, fabric work is buried in documents that have tables and or 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 other types of you know data in association with each other that needs to be pulled out and made explicit and say ah there's the connection <laughs> between these two concepts and now my my data starts to come together and, and you can draw draw a, a better picture um uh, mark logic's ability to manage both the documents so you can have all your documents you know text indexed keyword indexed alongside triples uh, that that are explicit facts extracted from documents that uh, Semaphore can help do. Uh, that's where you really get a powerful and you know, yeah. data. Uh, yeah, no, that's great. Thank you, um, thank you very much, uh, Jim. That was uh, that was really interesting. Um, I just go to Gerard on um, this question, which is, um, you know, what is it that you see as the key advantage? And maybe I go to the whole group, but what's the what do you see? is the key advantage of having that integration between our two technologies um, and, and, and what do you think that the benefits are going to bring to, to the customers? I think just, you know, just like the names, you know, we were smart logic previously now mark logic, but uh, there was no relation at the time, but that sort of synergy just made sense. Right. So that's why, you know, mark logic and smart logic were, were long time partners. So now you have, you know, a platform that can manage the data, but something on a platform that can also store and manage that data on a different level as well. So yeah. it, it's kind of bringing, you know, it's like vanilla and chocolate ice cream, you know, you bring them together, they're even better. Okay. And Stephen, um, from a, you know, what are you seeing in your, in your customers? What's the feedback? You know, the, the way sometimes, um, I explain it, or even customers have explained it to me, the, the pairing of the technologies. You know, if you think of the MarkLogic Data Hub platform as being able to break down data silos within your organization, then uh, Semaphore breaks down your information silos, right? So it's it's really the, the power of those two tools. And, you know, some, some people are starting to use the concept of now this provides a more agile data platform for me to be able to pull up applications faster, to build them faster, to do things faster, make decisions faster within my organization, all with that underlying idea of now I'm having a trusted common data set. Oh, yeah, no, that's um, really interesting. Um, and Steve, I, I, I mean, I'll just highlight again um, that question on the languages that we support. So, you know, we've got, I, I believe it was th 30 fully supported languages. Um, uh, that, that we have within Semaphore, and we seem to be adding more quite regularly. Um, I, see, I was sorry, I was on mute. Um, there's 30 languages that we support for full, full, they have full language support. So there's entity identification, part of speech analysis, um, NLP entity identification. And then there's 190 or more uh, languages that you can configure just, just if you want to be able to model them. Um, so, you know, any language in the world, pretty much, you can model in. That language, if you want to actually process text, then uh, yes, you are, sorry, if you want to actually go to the deeper level of text in terms of understanding the words in context, then um, that's sort of 30 other languages, but it's uh, all, all the normal Western ones plus Chinese, uh, Russian, Arabic, um, 
yeah, various oh, forms okay. of Turkish. Um, and and James, in terms of um, the, the the like the industry standard ontologies, um, I'm thinking like SNOMED, um, uh, and I think like that. how easy is that to bring into to, to Semaphore um, uh, for for customers that are looking to to, to bring in those. Yeah, it can be brought in in a number of ways. I mean, these, these vocabularies are supplied in different ways, um, uh, whether it's in a tabular format or in an RDF format. Uh, a lot of these models are provided in that uh, triple RDF format. Uh, one of the features of Semaphore is that, um, you know, some of these ontologies are very different in their source system. So making use of all of them in conjunction is you know, they're, they're all talking kind of a different language, even though they might all be called ontologies in loosely. Um, so in Semaphore, we, we uh, take the data in and, and nor normalize it to a degree. I mean, we can keep the data exactly as it is, but add stuff to it. So it actually be, can be applied consistently downstream to do the type of classification and, and data normalization that's needed. So we really, it's really not just about the storing these things. It's really about putting them to work. And to put them to work, um, uh, we look at them in, 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 in some different ways in order to make use of it in the best way downstream. Yeah. Um, and um, I'll, I'll throw another one at, um, at Stephen there. Um, from a regulatory report uh, point of view, can this, um, this work that you do behind the scenes with this data, can that be interrogated? Can it be... Can it be monitors? Can it be, you know, checked version histories and things like that with this data? So one of the things that makes our platform really interesting and really unique is that it's fully transparent. So a lot of times you'll hear this concept of, you know, transparent versus non-transparent AI. What that really means is we're fully auditable, right? So we can, you know, repeat, you know, any at any point, back in time say why was this decision made for this particular document so we keep a we keep a record of all those different models that were used so for that reason we're, we're fully auditable so that does that that does help a lot with all those compliance yeah. kind of issues and concerns um that we are a fully audible platform yeah and i guess then with the power of model logics um by temporality and things like that that adds, adds further further um regulatory compliance for people as well um I think that is every question. I think that's everything. I think I want to thank um, everyone who um, filled out the polls that, that we've put up there. Um, it's good, like I say, it'll inform our decisions going forward and what people would like to see and what we'll work on next. I can see that the the smarter content authoring and publishing seems to be um, seems to be quite popular. So we'll um, we'll certainly look into do an event themed around that um and also keep an eye out we like I say we're in discussions at the moment at that mark logic vision event um where we talk about mark logic where we're going with the technology the product roadmap but key really is then getting that feedback from from you the mark logic and and semaphore users so that we can develop the the product for you um again these are your events so if you have any questions um, queries or if you'd like to make some suggestions please feel free um, to contact us um, if you search for mark logic and digital acceleration um, on google you'll find that the top link will lead you to a page where there is a um, contact us um, section at the bottom there um, and you can reach out uh, via that or alternatively send an email to csm at marklogic.com um, right i think that is everything um, i'd just like to thank um, our speakers today, uh, Stephen, uh, thank you very much, uh, James, uh, Gerard, and Steve. Um, it's been really fascinating, really interesting, um, and uh, I hope that we can uh, do this again uh, in the future. And uh, and well, it looks like we'll be talking about smarter content and uh, publishing. So uh, so get your thinking caps on, uh, and we'll do that for next time. Uh, cheers everyone thank you for coming today thank you to our audience um and uh, we look forward to seeing you in the future